Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center. I'm NASA Press Secretary Jackie McGinnis. And as you all know, in just a few days, NASA's Artemis I mission is scheduled to lift off from Kennedy's historic launch pad 39B. It'll put us on a path to return humans to the moon for scientific discovery, technological innovation and development, and extend humanity further into the solar system than ever before with the first human missions to Mars. Landing humans on Mars is no easy feat. And so our guests today on today's panel will tell you about the work across NASA that will make our goals of long-term exploration at the moon and on Mars a reality. Joining us today, we have NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Pavia Lal, NASA Associate Administrator for Technology, Policy, and Strategy, Jim Free, NASA Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, Kathy Leaders, NASA Associate Administrator for the Space Operations Mission Directorate, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, NASA Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Prasan Desai, NASA Deputy Associate Administrator for the Space Technology Mission Directorate, and NASA astronaut Randy Bresnik. We'll hear from each of our speakers and then it'll open it up for questions from folks in the room, on the phone, and on social media. You can press star one to get into the question queue and use hashtag Artemis to ask your questions online. Uh, Administrator Nelson, take it away. Thank you, Jackie. Well, here we are. We're going back to the moon, but we're going to live and learn and develop new technologies because we're eventually going to Mars. The goal was set by President Obama. He gave a date of 2033. It's more likely that now through several administrations into the Biden administration, uh, we'll see that landing on Mars in the late in the decade of the 2030s. But it's a, a time of excitement. Just think what's happened in, in just a little over the last year. Uh, we landed on Mars with a rover that's the size of a truck, and we flew a little helicopter in an atmosphere that has a 1% atmosphere. Uh, and then uh, look at uh, what happened starting Christmas morning. And the result of that, after 244 things, after a perfect launch, had to work, uh, we are getting the first pictures of what will be 20 years of pictures of light that has originated in the far reaches of the universe. Already, we've seen it over 13 billion years at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. It'll look back to 13 and a half billion years shortly after the very beginning. So there's a big, big universe out there to explore. And this is the next step in that exploration. And this time we go with our international partners. Uh, and indeed, our international partners are many. And you see on this mission, uh, the European Service Module, uh, once uh, we get into orbit uh, on Artemis IV and start to develop gateway like an outpost or a mini space station, in lunar polar orbit, uh, there will be many international partners, and those will be announced over the course of time. And those international agreements are being signed. Indeed, the Artemis Accords setting the standards uh, for how we're going to conduct ourselves in space have already been signed by 22 nations. Uh, we do so at a time that it's a difficult time on the face of the earth in Ukraine for a very aggressive President Putin uh, has a war going on there and yet 
on the space station, our Russian partners, the professional relationship between the cosmonauts and the astronauts doesn't miss a beat, nor does it the two uh, mission control centers, one in Moscow and one in Houston. Indeed, uh, in just a few weeks, an American astronaut will launch on a Soyuz, and in a few more weeks, a Russian woman cosmonaut will launch on a SpaceX uh, as part of the integrated crew that is necessary to operate the space station. This mission goes with a lot of hopes and dreams of a lot of people, and we now are the Artemis generation. But one of our special guests here two days from now will be General Tom Stafford, uh, the commander of Apollo 10. It's no longer the Apollo generation. It's the Artemis generation. And that brings new discoveries, a whole new world of discoveries. And those discoveries are being made now by the people on this panel. And I want you to meet Dr. Pavia Law. Uh, she is uh, one of the smartest people in NASA. So let me turn it to you, Pavia. Thank you, Administrator Nelson. As Jackie said, I think about strategy and policy issues at NASA. Uh, and it's an honor to be here to be talking to you and on the stage with these amazing people. Um, with, with the Artemis One launch on Monday, NASA is at a historic inflection point, poised to begin the most significant series of science and human exploration missions in over a generation. We are making sure that the agency's architecture for human exploration is grounded in a long-term strategic vision, that of sustained U.S. presence on the Moon, Mars, and throughout the solar system. This vision is influenced by three external factors in particular. First, incredible growth of capabilities internationally and in the commercial sector that offer an expansive array of uh, collaboration opportunities. Second, robust and growing geopolitical co competition that Senator Nelson mentioned that will affect all of our nation's space activities. And third, a fiscal environment that will require us to optimize our resources, our workforce effort, funding, and timelines. Buoyed by these opportunities, and in discussion with industry and our international partners, NASA is working hard to establish a technically and politically resilient architecture for our long-term exploration efforts. The architecture has four interrelated components. The first component is transportation and habitation. We would like to develop and demonstrate an integrated system of systems to conduct a campaign of human missions to the moon and Mars, living, working and conducting science on lunar and Martian surfaces and a safe return to Earth, of course. I want to point out here that space nuclear propulsion is a key foundational capability of this transportation pillar. Nuclear propulsion will enable not just human missions to Mars, but also scientific missions deep into the solar system. And it would not be an exaggeration to say at all that the ability to develop and use nuclear propulsion safely, securely, and sustainably is vital to maintaining our global U.S. leadership in space. The second component is infrastructure. We would like to create a lunar utilization infrastructure such that U.S. industry and our international partners can maintain a continuous robotic and human presence on the lunar surface for a robust deep space economy without NASA as a sole user while accomplishing Mars testing and science objectives. A third critical component is operations. We would like to conduct human missions on the surface of and around the moon, followed by missions to Mars. Using a gradual built-up approach, we would like to demonstrate technologies and operations to live and work on a planetary surface other than Earth. Last and absolutely critical is science. We would like to conduct science on the moon and in lunar space using integrated human and robotic methods to address high priority questions about the moon and demonstrate methods for future science by astronauts beyond the Earth-Moon system. 
My rock star colleague and director of exploration systems director Jim Free can elaborate on how we plan to execute on this architecture. Suffice it to say that through our human exploration efforts, we seek to imagine and create first ever missions and approaches that showcase American ingenuity, pioneer new science and technology, improve long-term affordability, reinforce U.S. preeminence, improve life on Earth, and address critical national challenges. Let me end my remarks by saying that what we are starting with the launch Monday is not a near-term sprint, but a long-term marathon to bring the solar system and beyond into our sphere. I feel privileged to be part of this invigorating vision, and let me hand off to Jim now. Thanks, Pavia. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is really uh, a great honor to be here with all of you and uh, with the folks on this panel, uh, especially my mission directorate, um, colleagues and, and friends, I think I could say that, um, and to be part of the exploration systems development, um, what we're trying to do uh, globally, and frankly, to be part of the Artemis One team is, is a great, uh, great honor for me. If I could have the first slide, please. Um, we do have a beautiful vehicle out at the pad uh, today, although at one point you couldn't even see it. It was raining so hard. Um, we have a, a launch team and an ops team and a recovery team that um, are rested, as rested as those folks can be with the hard work they've had and the excitement they have uh, ahead. Um, we did have our L-2 mission management team. You heard about that today. Um, and the vehicle is so attractive, it uh, got a nice uh, lightning strike to our lightning tower number two uh, today. I know some of you have heard about that. Um, I, I looked at my phone as close to 2.30 as I could. I told them I was coming on here. Um, it looks like it was a low magnitude strike. Um, it, 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 has, it has the potential to have crossed a threshold, but the, the teams are looking on it. As you can imagine, a lightning strike uh, there are a lot of nuanced parts of a lightning strike analysis that you have to do, so uh, they're working through that now. I'm sure they'll get, uh, get an answer out here this afternoon. So, uh, so still, uh, still work ahead, but, uh, but uh, we did do call to stations today, as you heard earlier, so it is exciting. And this first mission is our first uh, test of our deep space transportation systems before we put crew on them. It is foundational in that sense that uh, we need to learn about the vehicles, uh, before we put crew on them uh, for Artemis II. It also sets us up long-term at the moon um, and on our Artemis campaign going to Mars. Um, I love the way the administrator started talking about Mars. Um, but as you've heard over the course of the briefings this week, this is a very risky mission. We have, uh, I'll say, simple but aggressive objectives. Uh, that is to get the vehicle into orbit, in orbit, and back home and understand how the systems operate. We need to understand how the heat shield performs um, uh, on its reentry, and we need to recover the vehicle. All of those things are the, our objectives. Uh, I'll say those three objectives. Um, we do have a lot of uh, things that could go wrong during the mission and places where we may come home early, where we may um, have, to, uh, to have to abort to come home. Um, that's how we test the system, too. Um, with that objective of getting the vehicle back, that is incredibly important as well. So we will be balancing risk. And I say we, look, it's the teams that are launching this thing and operating it um, and, and plucking it out of the ocean. Those are the folks balancing the risk. And we put systems in place to understand the risk and know the risk we're taking. But that risk um, is there because there's great reward on the other side. Going to the moon, studying the environment of the moon, um, what you can learn by staying there longer um, and developing those capabilities we need on the lunar surface and in orbit around the moon, it's very much worth that. Um, it's even more worth it when you consider what Artemis does here on Earth. We talk a lot about what's going to happen in the next 42 days, but the tech development, um, the investment in state-of-the-art facilities, advanced manufacturing, um, diverse businesses that can uh, uh, provide uh, components to us, supply chain issues. I think you've heard about that along the way. Uh, growing the aerospace field, which, uh, frankly, I'm completely biased since that's the field I'm in. Um, you know, that new generation of workers that are going to be inspired by seeing that rocket fly and that capsule fly and come home, 
um, I think will, will generate as much as the Apollo generation did. That long-term presence, economic benefit, and really that thirst for science is what makes Artemis different. And we have put science in from the very beginning. I actually got interviewed for Science in Seconds today. I was very honored. Uh, I said probably I could speak uh, seconds about science. But, uh, um, but the science is what we're doing from the beginning. Dr. Zubukin will talk about some of the science on this mission um, and, and how we're really planning to get that central to our architecture in the future. Next slide, please. You know, as we develop our architecture, um, sorry, I have to see the slide. <laughs> as we develop our arch architecture, as I said, science in mind, right? We're starting with our rocket, our spacecraft, and our ground systems that get us there. Next slide, please. Gateway, our gateway uh, in orbit around the moon has science being built for today by the science mission director and our international partners. It's our transfer point, our staging area. The landing system that's going to put boots on the surface for us in development today. The rover that will take the astronauts out to the science sites, both pressurized and unpressurized rovers. The suits that they're, they, they use to navigate through the surface and pick up the samples to bring home. We'll design each of those elements with science in mind. As more science equals more learning about the moon, how it formed, how we can stay long term, and how we move on to Mars. And as we learn about the moon and build out our lunar presence, looking at our systems going for going to Mars, we'll develop capabilities at the moon that will enable those things to happen. We need the transportation, the habitation, the things that Pavia talked about that we're putting central to our objectives. We're going to be sustainable this time. That doesn't mean we're staying 365 days a year. It means we're going to be able to stay for 30 days and help enable others to stay there while we're not there. But the important part of this is we're going for all humanity, and we're going with all humanity. The more nations and companies at the moon, the more we learn, exponentially increasing our knowledge base and capabilities while strengthening things right here on Earth. Our campaign, our Artemis campaign, is encompassing, and we're excited to kick it off with the launch of Artemis One, and thankful for you all to be here and, uh, and online today. So with that, let me hand it over to my uh, closest colleague up here, my uh, one that in, um, I'm completely uh, uh, close to here, Kathy Leaders. Thank you, Jim. It's really amazing to be, you know, part of this Artemis team. I'd say everybody here on the dais here is part of our Artemis team, and here representing the broader team that's out there really getting all this work done. And um, I'm going to jump into my first slide. You know, what's important is this team's been getting ready for a while. You have to really prepare and learn to be able to get ready for, for the, the mission that's going to be going off this Monday. And we're preparing for the missions coming up. And so here's a great picture of Kate Rubens. Kate Rubens is at the ESA's Pangaea training course in the volcanic area, the Spain's Canary Islands. It's another example of the teamwork that the administrator talked about. Here we're working with the ESA folks on how do we get ready? How do we go figure out how we're going to go establish the procedures and processes to be able to go do the science that Jim talked about? Um, next slide, please. Here's one, another one of my favorite pictures because it, it shows not only do we have to figure out how to work on a surface, which is what Kate and the team were doing, but we also have to figure out how to live and work in space because as we're going and doing living around the moon and on the moon, we have to figure out how to work in these different gravitational fields and be able to have processes to be able to take care of the humans that will be doing those missions. And so the International Space Station, like the administrator said before, is a, a place where international teams work together, just like we will need to have international teams working together and operating together in the future. You know, if you see there, there in the pictures, there's my, one of my favorite things as an ex-New Mexico person, a hatch chili, and you've got to figure out how to have food in space to be able to, to be able to live and work for a length of time in space. In addition, in the last picture you saw, you know, Scott giving himself his own flu shot. And so that's another thing we're going to have to figure out how to deal and be able to take care of our crew members. And all the learning we're doing on the International Space Station right now helps us do that. Next slide. 
This is a picture that's a great example of the collaboration across NASA. This is us doing our upgrade of our IROSA solar arrays, which were actually started with our space tech brethren over there, and thank you, Prasan, um, because the technology that was developed and is being proven on the International Space Station is also being carried forward into the gateway. And so it's another place where we're continuing to, as a team, um, develop, mature, and use across the different platforms that we have for us to be able to live and operate in space and do the science for, for Thomas's group over here um, to be able to accomplish the mission that we need to have. Um, next slide. I tell everybody, I said, you know, without COM and data and commanding and everything else going back and forth, we don't get the critical science data. We can't command the vehicles that keep our crew members safe and be able to get things done. And so there's a whole international group of antennas and ground stations and, and processing facilities that are going to be supporting this mission and providing critical capabilities to be able to do to be able to conduct and monitor and collect the data on the hardware that we're going to be flying. That data is very, very important for us to learn from and then be able to apply to the next part of the mission. It's also very important to be able to collect the data from those science experiments that we'll be doing that Thomas will be talking about. And next slide. So we've got a lot to learn before we go figure out how to live and work and around the moon and on the moon, and all that will be helping us then to be able to further apply that learning, because it's going to be even tougher for us to, to be able to go live and operate on Mars. And so what's really great is that here I am with a team of folks that are going to help us go get there, and um, one of the most critical activities we have while we're doing it is to do our science. And so I'm going to hand over to Thomas Zubukin who will be talking about the science we'll be doing on this mission and the importance of it. Thanks so much, Kathy. And uh, you, of course, talk about that solar array. And I'm reminded that in, in about a month, uh, DART will hit uh, a little ast uh, asteroid out there, the Demos. Uh, and it's, of course, powered by a, a solar panel just like that. Again, uh, developed by Space Tech. And we're using it for the science missions as well. You know, the word that both of you are using, uh, that really is the key of my uh, notes, is learning. Yes, we're exploring. Yes, we're doing science. Yes, we're building infrastructure, but we're learning. And what I want to talk about is uh, the learning of science. And I could talk about the robotic missions, including the ones that have mapped the moon for, frankly, over a decade, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, others that are there and have done amazing work. Uh, but I want to talk uh, and kind of go back and look at human exploration. And the first image gives you my favorite picture of human exploration. If you hang out with me, you know that picture which is a picture of, uh, first slide please, uh, is a picture of Buzz Aldrin uh, standing next to a uh, science experiment, which is a little foil, an aluminum foil that's correcting the solar wind as it's coming down at about 400 kilometers per second. From the backside, you see the shadow going forward. That, of course, was collected, brought back to Earth, and it's the kind of science that was done on Apollo uh, what, uh, what is so important to me and uh, what the next slide sh shows is that we're going to a moon that is very different than the moon we left with the Apollo program because science doesn't stand still. We learn a lot of uh, stuff about uh, this uh, moon and here is just one of the indications of it. It's, uh, of course, a measurement uh, by the Moon Mineralogical Mapper. Uh, on the Indian uh, mission uh, in 2009 and, of course, in a paper of 2018 that shows water resources. Uh, two of the CubeSats that are launching with Artemis One will map uh, that water at different uh, ways. Uh, one uh, using kind of epithermal neutrons, the other one uh, using IR to go look at uh, mapping uh, those resources that are there. It's those resources, of course, that are really, uh, you know, unexpected kind of in the picture of the moon that we had in the past. Uh, another uh, element that is so important in the science that is uh, done is uh, indi indicated on the next uh, slide, uh, please. Uh, uh, 
where we see uh, one of the researchers uh, who has built uh, an experiment, in this case with yeast, uh, that is out there and uh, the yeast being actually primed uh, to be very sensitive to the radiation that is there. You, of course, remember that the radiation away from the Earth, away from low Earth orbit, is different, uh, the space radiation, than the one here because, of course, there's a magnetic field that uh, deflects uh, a lot of the radiation that's coming down and uh, much of the radiation does not come up, right, because the radiation, space radiation, is not coming through the Earth. So it's a lot more radiation as you go uh, beyond that the radiation our astronauts uh, will, of course, uh, experience as we go there. And it's those experiments, uh, of course, 70% of the DNA uh, of yeast is very similar to the Earth, so we can learn about, uh, about this as we bring these back. Uh, there's not just yeast, there's other algae, uh, other kind of biological agents that are up there for us uh, to learn about uh, radiation damage. Uh, the most important part, though, is indicated on the next slide, which is the future. And I want to tell you, when I think of this, this is an artistic image, of course, of an astronaut on the surface uh, of, uh, of uh, the moon. And there uh, she is, and, you know, uh, you know lunar regolith is uh, through her hand uh, as, she, as she is there. And, and uh, what we're thinking about, of course, is the lunar landers that perhaps supported that, the, the overall... Uh, uh, artificial intelligence, perhaps even a ground team on the ground that actually with the enhanced calm that you just talked about, Kathy, will provide information that's there. Uh, so you say, well, that's nice, uh, nice fantasies. Uh, no, that's, that is what our decadal strategy of planetary science and astrobiology has told us to do. Precisely those kind of uh, robotic human uh, science that are prioritized for the first time by the National Academies and frankly just last week, we, uh, we listened to a presentation, all of us uh, up here, kind of, of, that, of that decadal coming back with these priorities. And, and uh, there's a lot to learn, but we're excited. And Artemis One is, is really the starting point of active learning of that human exploration and context of a moon, as I said, that is very different than the moon that we left uh, the last time we were there. Uh, many, many years ago when I was a little kid and I don't have any re recollection of that and neither do most of people on Earth. So, so that's what we're going to do. Now, tell us about Space Tech, Rasan. Thanks, Thomas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Um, it is a great honor uh, to be here at the Kennedy Space Center for this historic launch. The Space Technology Mission Director, or Space Tech, uh, as we go by, shares everyone's excitement for this mission, which is kicking off Artemis and many more robotic and human missions to come. We in space tech use our portfolio to develop technologies needed to go, land, live, and explore on the moon and Mars in collaboration with industry, academia, and other government agencies. One of these industry collaborations resulted in the technology that we'll be flying on Monday. Um, first uh, chart, please. Um, Pennsylvania and California small businesses, Bally Ribbon Mills, and advanced applied composite San Diego, led by NASA experts, developed a one-of-a-kind, robust, multifunctional material for the spacecraft heat shield. Here you see an image of the uh, equipment uh, weaving that material uh, um, for, for use on um, the Orion space capsule. They worked uh, with STMD, to, or, or Space Tech, to mature, test, and deliver this woven thermal protection material for Artemis One. Next image, please. Lockheed Martin used the material for Orion's heat shield compression pads. Here's a close-up look of, of what that looks like. If you go to the uh, next uh, image, please. Uh, and um, on various locations around the surface of the outside of the aeroshell, as well as to insulate and protect uh, other parts of the spacecraft. These are just two examples of small businesses supporting our next uh, steps in human exploration by implementing new technology. We uh, also will work with industry to support technologies in the areas like excavation, construction, in situ resource utilization, and power for the moon and Mars. This past week, we announced awards for three companies to create prototypes for vertical solar array systems to provide continuous power near the surf uh, moon's south pole. We're also working on approaches to uh, develop power through ongoing fission surface power collaborations with the Department of Energy. 
This work will yield modular fission surface power systems designed for the moon, and we also plan for this technology to power our exploration on Mars in the future. Exploring Mars will require additional suite of new technologies. For instance, we recently announced a collaboration with the company Microchip Technology to develop a next generation high performance spaceflight computing processor. This processor will have 100 times the more computational capacity of current spaceflight computers and advanced fault tolerance, enabling the complex computations we need for future Mars missions and other places in the solar system. SDMD is fostering uh, technology to get humans to Mars and land on the surface. We're working with industry to mature nuclear propulsion technologies, which could provide the power and the speed we need to get crewed spacecraft to Mars in a shorter time frame. Once we arrive, landing on the order of 20 metric tons on Mars is also a challenge. Uh, can we go to the next image, please? Our lofted mission uh, will demonstrate an inflatable aeroshell technology that could help land uh, crewed missions on Mars. It is slated for a launch in beginning of Nove uh, November for a demonstration here at Earth. We're also demonstrating precision landing technologies like da navigation Doppler LiDAR on the moon um, under the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, or CLPS, program. Um, across all our focus areas, CLPS flights will, use, uh, us, uh, will help us demonstrate the technologies that can be used on the moon as well as Mars. A number of these technologies have already been started to be developed on a Perseverance rover and demonstrated. Uh, precision landing capability when Perseverance landed, and currently right now on Mars, we're converting the carbon dioxide oxygen from the atmosphere to um, oxygen that we could use for either refueling our spacecraft or breathing for uh, future human uh, crews. Um, in closing, I want to acknowledge and thank every individual, business, and supplier that is helping to make Artemis and beyond a reality. Together, we are charting the path to the moon and Mars through thousands of businesses and hundreds of towns across this country that are part of this endeavor with us. Thank you. Thanks, Prasan. And before we hand it over to Randy, we have a message from Jessica Watkins on the ISS. Hi. I'm NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins on board the International Space Station, flying 260 miles above our planet. From here, we have a tremendous view of our planet. It gives us great perspective on Earth itself, but also on the amazing accomplishments humanity can achieve. The space station has been the place where we've learned what it takes to live and work in space and how to keep astronauts healthy for long periods of time. So many of the things we do on the space station are giving us the knowledge, technologies, and tools we need for Artemis missions to the moon and for our human missions to Mars and beyond in the future. To me, exploration is about pushing the limits of what we're capable of. As someone with a background in planetary geology, I'm really looking forward to all the science we will conduct on the moon. The samples we'll bring back, the knowledge we'll gain from understanding the lunar environment better than we ever have before. I'm also looking forward to the surprises the things we'll find or learn that we don't know about yet. Our Moon to Mars exploration efforts are for everyone. We'll be watching the Artemis One launch from here on the space station along with all of you. Good luck to the Artemis team, the Space Launch System, and the Orion spacecraft. Thanks, and now Randy, she's teed it up for you. Well, there's a saying uh, in the space business that you never want to be a speaker that follows the astronaut. And, and I'd like to say I have to kind of add to that, you never want to be the speaker following the astronaut that's speaking from space. Um, but as the, you know, representing the implementers and the operators of all the science and exploration efforts you've heard, you know, this distinguished panel of NASA leaders discuss, NASA's astronaut corps has been involved every step of the way. Embedded in the programs and the directorates, we're there to share our spaceflight experience and expertise in the design and development of these spacecraft because ultimately we represent the people and the humans that will be on these vehicles that are going to be making these missions to the moon and then ultimately onto Mars. And so a lot of the progress recently has been on the hardware and certainly Artemis 1 being an uncrewed flight represents that hardware. Um, but the human presence has been involved along the way because that is the pathfinder for our next mission which is Artemis 2 which will send humans out beyond low Earth orbit for the first time since 1972. 
And so everything we're doing with Artemis One, we're looking at it through the lens of what can we prove out and what can we demonstrate that will buy down risk for the, for the Artemis Two crewed mission. Certainly, as, as Kathy uh, Leaders mentioned, you know, we're training our crews uh, through uh, earthbound analogs, space analogs, as well as ones that are, you know, taking the ISS, that incredible, you know, space exploration test bed, and using that for analogs as well as testing hardware. One example of that hardware is the fact that we know that Artemis is the sister of, of uh, Apollo, but the twin sister of the toilet is going to be on Artemis II that's over in the ONC, is up on the ISS right now, getting tested out and, and learning more about it before we actually fly it on the Artemis II mission. And so that's a you know, great example of that. And so we have an incredibly diverse astronaut office and astronaut corps, you know, in both terms of people and as from their experience. And we're able to harness all those skills and talents and a wide variety of them, you know, planetary geologist to military test pilot. You know, that's just one example of, you know, two people in the office. But we've got astrophysicists, we've got educators, we've got medical doctors, um, we've got engineers, of course, and uh, even... Uh, um, even a, a veterinarian. And so we're using all those talents to be able to go out and do these exploration missions that uh, are going to be taking place very soon on the moon and ultimately on Mars. So thank you. Thanks, Randy. And now we want to hear from you all. So for folks in the room, if you have a question, if you could raise your hand. As a reminder for the folks on the phone, if you could please press star one to get in the queue. And online, if you could use hashtag Artemis. Uh, first up, Marsha Don with AP. Um, Marcia Dunn, AP for Mr. Free. Um, I was hoping you could explain the two-year lag between Artemis 1 and 2. What's driving that? And if this test flight goes really well, can you push up the next flight and make it sooner than 2024? Yeah, so uh, there's, there's a couple. There's just the development of the vehicle. So, so the Orion crew module for Artemis 2 uh, is fully outfitted with all the environmental control and life support systems that we need for the crew. So the, uh, the development of that and the integration of it is, uh, is complex and is, is one of the things that uh, is driving the, the uh, uh, time between. The other is we're use, reusing our um, avionics boxes from Artemis 1 on Artemis 2. So we need to get the vehicle back. I talked about our objectives, getting the vehicle back, getting those um, uh, boxes out and uh, retesting them. We have to send them back to the vendor to retest them, then getting them back and putting them in the crew module, and then putting everything else around it that, uh, that needs to be installed, and uh, getting the vehicle tested and ready to go to be delivered. So, um, and the, the stakes are, are really high for that mission, so we're going to take our time and do it right. Um, so as Artemis 1 has slipped out, that's driven some of the Artemis 2 uh, schedule uh, as well, but those are the three things that, that link it. So can we pull, I'm sorry, the second part of your question, can we pull it up sooner? Um, I, I think what I'd say is we're going to get through Artemis 1. We're going to learn a lot on Artemis 1. So I, I could not stand up here and say, hey, let's, let's pull it in. We, we're going to take some time to go through the data we find on, on Artemis 1 mission. And, you know, worst case is we might have to make a design change. But the best case is we're going to do the right thing to keep the, the one of the folks down at the end of the table, they're safe when they fly on it. That'll be our, our most important thing. So I don't think we'll pull it in. Thanks, Jim. Lauren Grush with Bloomberg. Hi, Lauren Grush with Bloomberg. Um, it's the first time I'm saying that. <laughs> um, so I, you talked a lot about sustainability. I was wondering if you could be more specific about what sustainability looks like on the moon. Can we say that that is a, a habitat, a base on the lunar surface? Ultimately, how do you envision people living and working on the moon? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Anybody else can add in there since I think I said sustainable more <laughs> than anybody. Um, it, it's really what I said. We, we, wanna, we want a, uh, an infrastructure on, on the moon that we can rely on when, when we go. So you talked about habitats. Um, there's other things on there that we need. We need landing pads. We need communication systems. We need distributed power. Um, so it's not really just about, hey, we're going to go and stay uh, and, and set ourselves up for 30 days. It's we want everyone to contribute to it. So commercial entities, international partners. So the sustainability is we can go, anybody else can go, and we can stay for longer durations. That's really how I, how I think we look at the sustainable piece. We, we can't do it all ourselves. 
think yes. people tend to think about the crude piece of it, which is important, but we also, when we start looking at operating, it's how do you meld the crude piece of it, and then what Thomas was saying, the uncrewed piece of it in some ways to optimize science and technology development that we are hoping to get done, um, and optimizing the use of the infrastructure up there for our missions and mission purposes. I will also add to that, uh, in space, uh, uh, what we'll plan to do is institute resource utilization as well, to use, live off the land in essence, so we can get a lot of consumables from the environment there in the soil or the water that we believe it's there. Uh, we will use that to create a sustainable future as well. Chris Davenport with Washington Post. So just to follow up on that, um, for whoever wants to take it, there's a lot of talk about the astronauts and the rockets, and that gets a lot of the attention, but things like distributed power and dealing with ISRU and regolith, all those problems, I just wonder, do you feel like you're investing enough in those programs to create the sustainable presence? I don't mind starting, and I think Prasan can probably talk about some of the other. From, uh, from my perspective, we have to put our plans together now for what we need as we develop the architecture. Um, so we need to put in our budgets today the surface habitation that was mentioned earlier. We need to put the, in the budget uh, today the rovers that we need uh, to get out and, and do the science. So that's why when we plan the Artemis missions, we're planning them kind of in, uh, I'll say, in, uh, in chunks. Right? We, we need to get this done so then we can put our budget plan together. And then what, what feeds those, uh, those elements that we bring down are the technologies that are developed in, in STMD. So are we doing enough? I would say I'd love to be doing more, but we also have to be realistic with uh, the, uh, the development that, that we can take on, that we can do in partnership with other countries and other entities, and then how fast the technology can be, can be built as well. So Prasanna, I don't know if you want to follow on to that. I would add, um so we, we are making investments now. We have, we have plans for all the various different types of technologies to develop so that we can have the infrastructure in place. Um, power, it starts with power. Uh, power enables you to do everything. So uh, we need to be able to have sustainable power on the surface. And you mentioned, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, we awarded three contracts just last week to start to getting that uh, capability. We're developing modular power systems, fission-based, that will also increase the amount of power. And with that, we have plans for doing a pilot plant for in situ resource utilization, where we will excavate and um, process uh, the regolith and or the water to get uh, uh, consumables that will be useful for us in the future for all our activities. And so we are laying the foundation for um, all the different systems that are needed, um, communications, for example, um, structural, you know, um, advanced uh, manufacturing to do autonomous structure uh, uh, building on the, on the surface. So all these things we are making investments on. And sure, um, uh, we'd always like to do more than um, uh, with, with uh, uh, higher budgets, but we, we are starting that process now. Also, if I could add to that, we're also thinking creatively about how to bring commercial entities in as, as bigger partners, so not just, um, you know, buy their technology, but think about buying power and some of those as services. So it's the range of options that are being considered. Jeff Faust with Space News. Hi, <clears throat> Jeff Faust, Space News. Question for the Administrator. Uh, when you were in the Senate, you helped craft the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 that directed NASA to develop the SLS that's now sitting on the pad at 39B. Um, that bill directed NASA to develop it by 2017, and it's now 2022. From your perspective, you know, what sort of lessons can NASA take away from that extended development of SLS um, and apply them to future elements of this Moon to Mars architecture so we don't see similar delays in the future? That legislation now law also directed the development of the commercial activities in space. And we have seen the uh, extraordinary successful uh, commercial crew, uh, commercial uh, cargo to orbit under uh, Kathy's leadership. 
uh, and the combination is what has been described to you today. Now, your essential question is, what do you do to stop there being cost overruns and overruns on time? Uh, I would simply say to you that space is hard, and you are developing new systems and new technologies, and uh, it takes money and it takes time. Uh, need you look any further than the extraordinary instrument we have uh, a million miles from Earth now taking pictures of the universe looking back in time. So uh, what we are doing in the future to try to stop some of these cost overruns, we are simplifying the system. We are taking, for example, 16 contracts and combining them into one so that we have one area that uh, one contractor that is responsible for all the subs. We're implementing a program office for Moon to Mars so that we can have better coordination there. Uh, we're trying to do all of these things and at the same time do space. Uh, and uh, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, but right now, uh, we're on the cusp of something that is pretty great. And it's been described to you uh, from this panel, uh, and you have been seeing it out there, and the hopes and dreams are on that pad, 39B, right now. Next, we're going to take a question from the phone. Christopher Kokonos from Astronomy Magazine. Yes, hi, thank you very much, and good luck um, on the launch. Uh, I do want to ask uh, Administrator Nelson a, a, a question from sort of maybe the devil's advocate or uh, critical side, and that has to do with the cadence of Artemis. And as you all know, Apollo had many, many more test flights of the Saturns and the different modules before even attempting a landing, and Artemis's cadence is much faster before landing in a rugged and thermally challenging polar environment. So I'm just wondering if the administrator can answer back uh, to those who think Artemis cannot or should not move this fast and try to land on the third mission. What do you say to those who think the, the Artemis cadence is, is maybe too aggressive? Thank you and good luck. Thank you. It's two different times. That was 50 years ago. Look at the advance of technology. Uh, I have ultimate trust in these people up here to know exactly when we should launch, and that's why this is a test flight. And as Jim Free said, this thing's going to be stressed and test uh, in a way that we wouldn't put humans on this. That's the whole purpose of the test flight. He has three main objectives, one of which you can't test in a lab. You have to bring it back hot and fast to see if that heat shield is going to do what it's designed to do. Uh, and uh, so that's the difference of 50 years of technology and techniques and uh, computing and all the advances that go into this. But when you get right down to it, space flight is risky business. Uh, and we accept the risk because there is great reward. To do less is to deny ourselves and our identity as the American, the American character. Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks. Thank you. Um, for Senator Nelson and anybody else who might want to chime in, um, what do you think at this point is the pacing item to get astronauts to Mars in the next 15 to 18 years? Uh, the timetable was set by President Obama. He said 2033. Uh, each successive administration has supported the program. And 
Uh, the realistic time now that I'm informed is late 2030s, maybe 2040. Uh, would anybody like to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say the pacing items are environmental control and life support. Um, we're doing testing on ISS to try and buy that down today. Radiation protection for the crew. Um, obviously, the, the effects are a lot different. Uh, as has been said, outside of uh, low Earth orbit, and uh, an entry, descent, and landing. Um, I mean, we, we've landed, I'm, I'm probably going to run, you know, one metric ton, and, and we have to land like 15 to 20 to get humans down there. So, and those tests are much like things we are, are we can do them back on Earth, like lofted, that Prasan talked about, but that technology has to be developed. And I haven't even mentioned propulsion yet. But because um, everybody, you know, that is the kind of everybody jumps to propulsion, but the three things I mentioned have to be solved as well. So to me, those are the pacing items. Um, a lot of that work is happening uh, on ISS today with, with, with fun funding out of our organization um, uh, for the life support system. There's radiation protection uh, things going on, entry, descent, and landing. So those investments are starting now. But to me, those are the three that I would highlight outside of propulsion. I think one of the things people don't think about is keeping the crew healthy, both physically and psychologically, for a three-year tour, right? And when you think about it, it's why having these differential um, environments to be able to do, have crews be able to be on orbit the International Space Station, land. We right now actually have the crew, as soon as they land, go do different activities to see what they can do after being on orbit and, and being under certain protocols, Irene, to, because if they land on, the, on Mars, they're going to have to do things when they land on Mars after this trip. And so, you know, it's really what's great about that mission is it's testing us on all fronts, human, technology, behavioral, you know, and it's going to take us really advancing the state across everything, which is exactly what you want us to be doing. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Jim. Uh, next up, BBC France. Uh, yeah, and, Radio, and Radio Canada, Frédéric Astaire. Uh, can you tell us, uh, you underlined the importance of the objective to land on the moon. What is precisely the schedule uh, once you have achieved this first mission successfully? What is the schedule when you don't have Starship, which has flown once? Thank you. So, uh, you know, we, we, to land on the moon, we, we have to have uh, the systems that will be tested on one. We have to have Starship, and we have to have our suits. We have a, uh, a development plan, a contract with uh, our uh, human lander sp company, SpaceX, that has development milestones in it uh, and technology development milestones that we work and we monitor with them uh, along their development path. And they... Um, our team understands the challenges that they have, and when they launch Starship, we'll be there with them, watching them develop the technologies that they need to. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we also just awarded our spacesuits contract, which is just as important. We, Starship could be ready, and if our suits aren't ready, we're not going to land on the moon, and the inverse is the same. If our suits are ready and Starship isn't, but I will tell you that when you get beyond Artemis III, and you start lining up Artemis 4 and 5, we have a lot of development to go through and a lot of things have to come together for the mission. So we've got to get used to the fact that some things are going to go slow, some things are going to go on schedule, and some things are going to go fast. But they all have to come together ultimately in that mission. My confidence comes from the fact that we have a human lander team that is, I believe, the best people in the world to understand landing on the moon. And we've entrusted that role with them, and we have a contract to SpaceX to deliver it, and it's their job to deliver to the contract that we need. Just can you tell us if 2025 remains realistic? That's, our, that's still our goal. That is still our goal. So the, I talked about SpaceX. We have those development milestones. We just awarded the suit contracts. Part of the way the contracts work for suits is we put task orders out. Uh, we just, uh, not just, August 5th, I think, got the first task order responses for exploration suits that have a schedule laid out in those. 
um, the, the, the team is trying to work with the contractor to put that task order in place. And, uh, and we'll hear from them, uh, in the, I'm sure, in the coming month, pending <laughs> what the next month looks like when we launch on Monday. But, uh, but short term, we, and we have our structure is the administrator talked about the Moon to Mars program office that we're, we've been uh, directed to put in place by, contract, uh, by Congress. But we have a structure, org structure today, that there's one person I can go point to and say, tell me how things are going on our MIS-3. And that person is tracking all the milestones that need to come together for that. We're still hopeful to make it there in 25. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Marcia Smith, Space Policy Online. Hi, my question is for Mr. Nelson and Bavia. When you're talking about the big strategy, the moon to Mars strategy, doing this in 18 years, I'm curious, how do you balance the interests of the people who just want to get to Mars and worry about getting stuck on the moon and those who really want to get stuck on the moon because they think there's a lot of stuff to do there and they want a sustainable presence? How do you balance that? How do you come up with a cadence of missions that's affordable and you know, politically saleable and all of that to satisfy both groups? So um, uh, that's an awesome question, and, and that has been the tension throughout. And in fact, that's one reason we've kind of gone you know, from moon to Mars to moon. Uh, and this administration obviously supported um, the continu you know, continuity of, of staying on, on course. I think what we have done is, and we are continuing to do, work with our industry partners and international partners to develop a series of objectives. In fact, about 50, and, and it's under, you know, it's under uh, development and, 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 and fine-tuning, and those objectives uh, emphasize both Moon and Mars as, as, as targets. Uh, they are well integrated, and they demonstrate how doing certain things on Moon help us get that extensibility to Mars, and, and that's kind of how we are striking that balance. Uh, it is never uh, Moon or Mars. It has to be moon on the way to Mars. Uh, Mars is the horizon goal. NASA's goal is to continue to push the horizons, and, and Mars is the horizon goal. I, I don't know, Santa Nelson, if you'd like to add, or Jim? And, and that's the legacy of the Biden administration. Uh, they have not, uh, ramped it up another notch. It's not just to the moon, it's to the moon, then to Mars. And um, that's what has been explained to you today. Uh, and that's how we're going to continue. You heard some of the exciting stuff that they're doing in space tech in order to prepare us. Uh, Jim mentioned that propulsion is a key because if we go at present uh, propulsion, it takes such a long time to get there, and then the planets are out of alignment. You've got to stay on the surface for such a long time for the first flight. Uh, you get a faster propulsion, you can go there, stay a few weeks, and come back. So all of this is working together. So how did that was a practical necessity to going to the moon uh, before Mars. You know, you take Apollo, and it brought back lunar regolith, and we found out how jagged and broken and, and destructive that was to mechanical, you know, things in the spacesuits. And, you know, our science folks, you know, with these incredible rovers we have on Mars, we know what that environment is, is pretty much like. And it's not as difficult as the, the lunar surface in terms of the mechanics of our rover's wheels and our gearboxes and our spacesuits and things like that. And so you, if you think of going to the moon as, you know, a camping expedition and, and Mars being a further out camping expedition, you're not going to go out to the Alaskan wilderness with just going to the sporting goods store and buying a tent and put, getting your boots that are brand new out of the box. And you're not going to go out to the Alaskan wilderness without having tried that stuff on yet, broken it in, make sure it works. You're going to go to some local place that's a little closer that maybe you, know, you, can, you can come back to pretty quickly, um, come back home if, you're, if your shoelaces break or something like that. We're not going to have that option when we go to Mars. It's a, you know, we take everything that we need with us. And so proving out all the logistics of the habitats and the hatches and the suits and the rovers and the wheels and all of that stuff, proving that out on the moon is just like Artemis I buying down risk for Artemis II. It buys down the risk so when we go to Mars, we deal with the ra exposure of the radiation on the long term. We deal with the fact that we've got to take all of our water and our food with us. And by taking care of buying down the risk of when we get there, the Mars, it's, it's the 
risk of getting there and the amount of time it takes, not so much on the surface that uh, our hardware will work the entire time we're there, however long or short that mission is. Thanks, Randy. Marina Corin, The Atlantic. Hi, Marina Corin with The Atlantic. Uh, two quick questions. First, for the administrator, is this NASA fully officially committing to establishing a permanent base on the moon in this decade or early the next decade? Um, do you have a timeline for that? And for Randy, as the person here with the most spaceflight experience and a unique understanding of how missions get ready and when they are ready, do you think 2025 is realistic for an Artemis landing? Thank you. There's nuance in the answer to the question about a permanent base. Jim has given you that nuance. Doesn't mean that we are there every minute of every day. Uh, we're talking about upwards of 30-day missions, but he said there might be another mission going on at the same time. Uh, also, we've got activities going on on Gateway. Uh, it's not a permanently uh, human presence on Gateway. It's more of an outpost, and yet it could be, and there could be all kinds of uh, new things that we're doing there. We don't know at this point what the technology is going to be on uh, the spacecraft that's going to go to Mars, but it is possible that it could be assembled in lunar orbit and then uh, go on its journey to Mars. Jim, you want to add to any of that? No, sir. I think you. Uh, I think you covered it uh, really well. The other part is, you know, the the permanence. That's that's what we're trying. When we talk about habitation, and you heard uh, uh, Randy talk about the difficulty at the at the South Pole, um, and you've heard many folks talk about the lighting and just uh, how hard it is. Uh, we have to decide. You know, putting one big habitat down is that the right thing to do? Because can we get back to it the next year if we have a a two-week launch delay where we wanted to land to get to that habitat, the lighting may not allow us to do it. So maybe we land there uh, somewhere else and drive the pressurized rover to it. We, that's what the architecture that's going to come out of the objectives that were talked about is really going to decide, is what is the, the, uh, the holistic solution of how much we invest in a single habitat versus a maybe a, a, a lot of different small, uh, small campers, bigger than the tent Randy talked about, some small, small campers around as well. So those are the trades we're going through right now. And so is 2025 realistic was the question. We're working as if it is. We have to. Otherwise, it ends up being an open-ended, you know, question that we, you know, we never, you know, reach. Um, was just out at SpaceX just this past week. We're with our HLS program folks and working in collaboration with them on Starship. And you look at the pace that they're working out there, and then you go, you know, you can go online and see, you know, SpaceX working down in Boca Chica where they're manufacturing these things. They're working towards that pace as well. And so that gives great hope that, you know, if we're going to get there, you know, we, we got the right partner right now for this first mission. You know, we'll find out more in the next coming months because we just assigned that suit contract. And as you know, Jim Free said, the suits and, and the Starship, the lunar lander, all go hand in hand. We can't have one without the other. So we'll get more clarity in the next few months how quickly our suits are going to be able to come up. But back to the earlier question about what's the difference between Apollo and now, back during Apollo, they didn't know they could do it. Everything they did was new. And we you know, built every flight, and you didn't know if you had to modify the next flight because everything that was being proven on that flight, you, you didn't know if it was possible. With Artemis, we have the benefit of the technology and the experience since then, and we know we can do it. We just now have to find the right people to build it, design it, and then ultimately go out and fly it. Thanks, Randy. Hand it over to Thalia from the digital team to take a question from online. Hey, thanks so much. I've got a question from Twitter. We've already discussed how research in low Earth orbit has prepared us for lunar human missions. Can you explain how lunar research on the moon will prepare us for sending astronauts to Mars? I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll take the first shot and then have Kathy weigh in. I think first is um, we learned a lot on, uh, on early shuttle flights and on ISS about microgravity and its effect on our systems. Um, now, uh, and, and things we, we spent years testing on the ground and then launched, and they had issues when they got to orbit. Um, we're going to take advantage of the partial gravity on the moon 
to test out some uh, uh, systems so that we know how systems on the surface of Mars in that partial gravity act as well. So to me, that's, that's the big theme that we need to get to, Kathy. I think the other thing is um, working as an integrated system, you know, working between a lunar orbiting platform and missions on the ground along with rovers during both uncrewed and crewed portions of the mission, um, working the communication networks that support that, integrating with power and distribution systems. You know, we have not operated, and it goes back to the same thing that Randy said, we have not operated at that level with that three-day delay, you know, and us getting ready to operate like that then also gets us ready to be able to figure out what are the key aspects of of how that operation needs to work to get ready for then applying that when we go to Mars. Um, it's, it's really, you know, we assembled a space station in LEO, but, and it was, it, we learned a lot from that, um, and we're applying that learning to our assembly of the, the gateway systems. Um, but this doing an integrated operational function between that, the lunar gateway and surface elements and coming back and, and doing that whole choreography, it's going to be an amazing um, challenge for our operations teams. You're in the second row. Nicole Mortolero, uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I guess this actually is a question for you, Jim. I know you said earlier that you wouldn't move Artemis II up. However, let's say, for example, you couldn't do a translunar injection and you had to do a free return. Would you consider moving Artemis II up as a second test? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think we need to look at how we achieved all the objectives. You know, that, that heat shield is such a critical uh, test for us. Um, and, if, and if we don't achieve the objectives, we need to take a hard look at what that second flight's going to be because of having crew on there. So, um, so I think we'll look at each of, each of the objectives and each of the systems and decide, well, I mean, we, we achieve all our objectives, right? Hey, we have good confidence that uh, we're okay to put crew on it, that, that still we can still keep our diligence in building the next vehicle. Um, but I think, you know, the, the what ifs are for us right now uh, probably hard to, hard to say would we turn that into a different test flight than we envision today. Uh, right now our, our belief is we're ready to fly on Monday. We've tested this vehicle on the ground as much as we can um, to get the data back that we needed. And now our best environment is in orbit and to get it back and understand the data and then see what Artemis II holds and hopefully it holds launching for crew. Here in front. Sawyer Rosenstein with Talking Space. Uh, when it comes to Gateway, uh, what are some of the main objectives that we're hoping to get from Gateway? And you were talking about the fact that there are portions where it will likely be without crew on board. Is there some research or anything that you're hoping to accomplish or that can be accomplished while it is just orbiting uncrewed? So I, I, I'll give you a brief answer and then maybe ask uh, Dr. Zabukin to, to follow up. Um, you know, the, the advantage of Gateway is its position in the near rectilinear halo orbit um, that we can access uh, almost all of the lunar surface um, and we have cons uh, a constant communication back with Earth. So it, it allows us to get to any place we'd really like to go and always be able to talk to it. When, it, when it's without crew, I'm sure we're still going to be running systems, so we're going to get runtime on our systems and get some understanding there. But let me have Thomas talk about the science side of it. So the way we think about uh, gateway is both by looking at the outside of the gateway, but also the inside of the gateway. Both are research platforms, just like on the space station. We have on the inside of uh, the space station amazing work going on by astronauts and some of the stuff remotely controlled from, from the ground, and then also on the outside. So on the outside, uh, we're going to launch uh, some of one of the systems with actually uh, hardware already science instruments already mounted to it, and it's going to be focused on radiation. Remember, one of the key challenges of, of uh, Mars, uh, a Mars trip, uh, because of its duration, because it's of in, its intensity, especially at various levels of solar activity cycle, is to manage radiation. 
So what we're going to do there is not only make measurements, but also develop software that help us kind of assimilate measurements from that uh, uh, platform into the forecasting system. That will be a technology that's essential as we go away from the Sun-Earth line where all of our forecasting occurs now. So, so basically it really is developing capability also with other cross-agency partners to do, do just that. So that's going to be on the outside. Uh, we actually think that there's other experiments. We're actually competing them in a science mission directorate, kind of in our AOs, announcements of opportunities. Individuals can uh, uh, use uh, the outside of the gateway. Uh, one thing you could think about is gamma ray uh, measurements, you know, which are pretty rare and you want book big baseline, so it matters that you're away from the Earth for that. That's outside. Inside is a variety of measurements of the type, frankly, not, you know, modeled by some of the uh, small payloads that, uh, that I just talked about. It really also there is looking at the different environment of space uh, that, that is there, using that as a platform. Uh, we're really interested in learning how life evolves in space on, along all these dimensions, gravity being one of them, you know, from 1G to zero. How, how we, on that axis, uh, how biology works is, frankly, very hard to understand. Like reproduction, how will it work on, on this, on this uh, axis? Uh, the other side, the other axis, of course, is pressure. There's, there's, you know, radiation environments on a third axis and so forth. So we're really trying to kind of connect experiments both on the space station uh, with uh, uh, the gateway and other platforms that uh, we're going to look at. So, so for us, uh, we think the, uh, the excitement is big in and, and the whole science community taking advantage of this. When astronauts are there, uh, we're really excited to work with them you know, uh, that, that are there so often that helps us accelerate. But, but much of the science that we're thinking about, frankly, can also, will also take advantage of the gateway when, uh, when it's not inhabited at that particular time. Here in the first row. Um, thank you, uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com. I think I have two short ones, one for Jim for clarification and one for Dr. Z. Jim, you mentioned sustainability beyond a 30-day mission uh, to the moon uh, and with, with NASA astronauts, and uh, I would assume that some of that is robotic work like we see on the, on the space station, but it, is there a, a, I guess, is there a, a concept for, for crewed flights, either uh, international partners that have their own landing systems that would then use uh, NASA assets on the ground or even commercial partners with their own missions like we're seeing on the space station now. And for Dr. Z, you said it's a brand new moon uh, since uh, the astronauts left on the Apollo mission. And beyond water and in situ resource utilization, what else can we do now, scientists do now with the moon to learn new secrets that we couldn't do for Apollo? Thanks. Ahead sure, and talk about ahead. that. So, so, and again, what I'm going to do is quote the decadal back to me because see, the a whole bunch of scientists are a lot smarter than one scientist, including, especially me. So, so, uh, so, what they're talking about uh, at there is uh, talk about the volatiles, but also talked about uh, the modern models of uh, solar system evolution that uh, that have some kind of open issues and things that are floating relative to the timing of a phase in a solar system evolution we consider really important where large planets migrated which led to a big great bombardment as we as we call it at the timing of that uh, the kind of in in time is is embedded on the far side of the moon that's where it's the right place to go go look at that i think the the other thing i want to talk about is some of the processes that relate to uh, what we call space weathering. So it's, it's not the same as space weather from the sun with storms and so forth. It's the series of interactions, both chemical and physical, that, sh that shape surfaces and let them uh, uh, kind of evolve in different ways. That's a lot more important now because we're looking at all these planets that are elsewhere and have their different, uh, their different kind of radiation kind of environments. And, and frankly, we believe the processes can be investigated best at the surface uh, of, of the moon. Needless to say, also that uh, in the decadal. Back to you now for your question. Okay, so don't follow an astronaut or a scientist. <laughs> uh, two lessons for everybody today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly what I was referring to, is our hope is that through the objectives that um, uh, the Senator and Pavia have talked about, uh, that we can, can build uh, infrastructure and things on the moon for other people to use. That's, we, we had objectives workshops. Um, both uh, with industry and academia here in the U.S., and then we had an international one where we brought everyone together to talk about objectives. 
so that we can uh, lay out a plan where other people can use the things that we have capability, uh, uh, that we've built and our capabilities, and we can take advantage perhaps of other countries or entities on the moon to further our missions um, and make them more scientific rich or, or uh, more expansive of the lunar surface. Micah Maidenberg with Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Uh, Associate Administrator Lau, you talked about making the architecture politically resilient. Could you elaborate on what you meant by that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a simple, simple explanation. Something that just doesn't go, you know, 180 every time the, an administration changes or something that is not solely driven by political considerations. So we just want stability in our space program. We want something that we continue to make progress and not just go back and forth. I think that's, that's what I meant, but if Senator Nelson or Jim, if you would like to elaborate further. And I think that's what you've seen and what we've talked about. For example, the Moon to Mars program. Uh, it was accelerated by President Obama. He set the goal of Mars. That has continued through every administration since. In the back row. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Thank you for doing this, and good luck tomorrow. I want to ask about Artemis II. It was mentioned also at the previous briefing. It's just going to be a lunar flyby. Why, why is that? Why don't you go more bolder? Why don't you go into orbit? Apollo 8, the first mission to the moon, went into lunar orbit. On this flight, you're going to be exercising the ICPS and, 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 and Orion for weeks on end. Why, why not go with a bolder mission on Artemis II? Thanks. Um, so uh, I think launching humans to go around the moon is, is pretty bold. Uh, and I would tell you that every time we look at these, we try and balance risk. So the free return trajectory for Artemis II is how we balance risk. So. You know, when we come off ICPS on Artemis II, we're going to uh, fly around ICPS, really understand the handling qualities for uh, the uh, operators, the astronauts. Um, and, and from our perspective, that, uh, that is risky. Um, four people in a new vehicle with a new ECLIS system is risky. Um, having the opportunity to get them home without absolutely needing the propulsion system and allowing for that failure, um, that's the free return trajectory. So for us, it's all about balance and risk. So when we add up all the risk on that mission um, and we talk about objectives for that, our first objective is going to be getting them back. And with the changes we have in that, in that Artemis II vehicle, we believe that the, the, the safest, while still having a lot of risk in the mission, the safest is to do the free return trajectory. Can I add that, you know, just last month we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16. And it was an event where Charlie Duke, you know, got up and said he thought the Apollo 8 mission, that was the boldest decision that NASA has ever done. And, you know, even you know, everything since then. And when you think about what Apollo 8 was, it was the flight after Apollo 7 where they actually put crew in the vehicle and flew it in low Earth orbit. And then they went to the boldly around the moon, which we had never done. Well. You think of Artemis II, it's Apollo 7 and 8 combined. You know, we will have not have ever put vehicle, people in the vehicle, as, as Jim was saying. And so that's why we're doing the high Earth orbit to check out those environmental and life control uh, system, uh, check them out during that first 24 hours to make sure that we can do that TLI burn and commit ourselves to the moon. But it's, that's, you know, I think that's pretty darn bold if it's Apollo 7 and 8 combined. And then we look at Artemis 3, which is going to be the combination of Apollo 9, 10, and 11 all in one flight. So NASA's going pretty bold, just figuring out where we put that risk. Here in the second row. Uh, Nicole Mortellaro, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. We did touch on uh, Lunar Gateway, and I wanted to ask if you could, uh, Jim or whoever could talk about your international partners and how it will be built, for example, with the Canadarm3. Right, so uh, our international partners are 
our on Artips one today uh, with the ESA service module and uh, a number of the CubeSats. So we're starting with international partnerships like we're starting with science. Um, so Gateway is the international partnerships there are, are truly incredible. The, the ARM, which will help us uh, much like uh, the ARM on ISS has evolved to help us with uh, operations. We were talking before this, uh, Randy shared about the AI interfaces that are going to be used for the ARM, um, which really expand our capability when we don't have crews present. Um, we'll also have the Europeans will be uh, providing the uh, international habitation module that will be, uh, will, will be on there, the Esprit refueling module um, that has participation uh, throughout Europe. The IHAB has JAXA, the Canadian arm. We're talking about other contributions for Gateway around the airlock with our international partners. So um, there is, that is the, the, the hub, no pun intended, really, of, of what we're doing uh, comes through Gateway. And I think it's built off of the success that we've had on ISS and learning to work together and learning to expand our partnerships. Kathy, do you have anything to add about how it's connected with ISS? Oh, I think, you know, when, um, when we talk about the continuum of space exploration with our partners, people talk about how it started with station and goes through gateway and then continues through the lunar surfaces and honestly wants to continue through the journey to Mars. So I really feel like, um, you know, the International Space Station has been a great endeavor to start this alliance of space exploration for the, for the world. And um, it's uh, really contributed to us to continue to find ways to have multiple folks partnering together in a way that gives us a massive amount of capability for each of the nations that are involved. Unfortunately, we're coming up on the end of our time here with you. Uh, we have time for one more question. There in the back. All right, this question is for the administrator and also for uh, Randy. Uh, Apollo was a, a kind of short compared to 30 years of shuttle compared to this, which is, I know Mars, Moon to Mars is your office, but once you get there, at what point is this a new era, and to what degree does this go out? And once you conquer Mars, what does that open up for you? And really for the astronaut corps, I want to know, what is the approach of, your, of the corps to potentially going on these missions that might be, right, the moon is, you're there and back, and Mars is much longer. So I'd like to know, has anybody thought about that, spoken about that? And those are my questions, thank you. Uh, you want me to start off? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, certainly being able to go there and come back to the moon, you know, in, in three days away. You know, something goes wrong, we can hop in a return vehicle, go up to the NRHO, and, and, and come on home. Um, there's, there's that big stretch where we go from having, you know, this constant contact with Earth, you know, maybe a little bit of calm delay, a little bit of time delay, uh, but real constant contact, constant availability. You can send up, you know, logistics modules to the gateway if, if, we, need more, if we need more supplies. Um, and as Kathy Leaders was, was mentioned, how we're using ISS to kind of look at beyond just the hardware aspects, you know, it's going to be a big difference when people are on a Martian vehicle and we go out beyond that point where you can no longer have constant contact with Earth, where every conversation you have is you recording something, sending it, and getting a recording back. I think that's going to have a profound, you know, psychological impact on the crews. And these are things that's, that's why we do these analogs out in the extreme areas on Earth. And we're trying to do more with ISS to expand and, and challenge the, you know, the, the way that we do operations. And so certainly we're all up for it. Um, we've used the uh, NEMO uh, underwater experience on uh, Aquarius on our NEMO missions um, to live down there for weeks at a time. And the one that I was on, we actually had a calm delay of 20 minutes. So we actually practice these types of things. Um, but I think of my experience on ISS where for, for five months I saw six human beings and listened to six human beings live. You know, can interact with six human, you know, you know, myself included. Um, and it was so different when I got back to Earth and I found that, you know, when I saw people that I'd known for years, I was, you know, it was tough to recognize, you know, put the face with the name. There's just something that you're not around it, you're not practicing that, that capability and that technique every day. 
And so when I think about now being, having, you know, however many people are on the crew, those are the only humans you see and interact with live for years at a time. We better make sure that we have, you know, pick the right crew, make sure they get plenty of opportunity to get to know each other and, and you know, be uh, confident and uh, careful about how they deal with and take care of each other, but also allow the assets that are on board the vehicle and back home on Earth to prepare them and allow them to continue that mission when they do reach those things and those points where we, we have not been before. At the core, your question is sort of what happens after Mars. And, and, and at the very highest level, our goal isn't just to go visit a place, right? It's to bring the solar system and beyond into our, into our economic realm. Right, and that isn't just something NASA does. Obviously, NASA is a leader there, and we think about it. But you know, all the people in the room, all the people watching—I mean, the entire global space community, the, all of humanity thinks about this, right? So, so it's in a way, it's sort of saying, you know, what happened after the Lewis and Clark expedition? Well, there was so much that happened after that, right? So, in it, this, it's sort of the same analogy. Obviously, it's harder. Um, you know, we don't have the same sorts of resources, but, but we have even more resources. And, and we think about it at NASA on a daily basis. I know there's those in the space community that think about it. You know, we want to learn to live off the land. We want to learn to live off the land, land for the long term. And those are the sorts of things that we want to do after, after Mars. Pretty incredible. Um, we're actually going to just do one more. Sorry, Jim, right in front. taking my question. Uh, Jim Siegel, I'm with uh, nasatech.net. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, the comment that Senator Nelson mentioned at the, at the outset um, about going to Mars and going to the moon. Uh, I find it pretty easy to, to describe to my readers why we're at the International Space Station, all the benefits, the hundreds and hundreds of benefits that we have gained as a society, not just as, as astronauts. Uh, but I'm having a little trouble doing the same thing for why are we going to Mars, for example. I've heard that uh, Mars has a lot of helium-3 and that can solve the energy crisis and, and so on. But, um, without being esoteric about this, without saying, well, it's because uh, Americans are leaders and kind of all of that. What would you tell the average Americans who might be sitting here right now? Why are we going to Mars? Why are we going to the moon? This is what I would tell them. First of all, we are explorers and adventurers as a species. That basically is the fulfillment of our destiny. Uh, but in that exploration, we're going to learn new things and develop new things that is going to improve, just as it's been under our space program, our lives here on Earth. Last week, I was in Kansas. I was with a corn farmer where we are giving him real-time information on the moisture content of the soil in this crop and next to it, that crop, so that he knows what to plant. Those instruments obviously, for example, can pick up disease uh, and pick up disease in uh, forest which then becomes susceptible to fire. That certainly is going to help our uh, life here on Earth. And those are things that have come out of the space program, things that we can't even think of. But there's more. When we go to Mars in the late 30s, just think how much more we're going to understand about our solar system and about the universe as a result of things like many of our instruments out there, not in the least of which is the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, we may have uh, by that time found an asteroid uh, that we don't have to protect Earth on, as we're going to try with DART in another month, 
but we may have found an asteroid that has valuable material on it, metals, that we could harvest. By 2040, we may have detected life elsewhere in the universe. And think what that's going to do in our yearning for exploration. So I can't answer specifically the question, what happens after Mars? I just know that we're going to know a lot more between now and then. And uh, our discoveries and our exploration are going to continue. And the apt uh, analogy was given by Pavia. When Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark all the way to the Pacific Coast, look what happened as a result of that exploration. And we are the beneficiaries of that today. If I could add one more thing to that, completely 100%, um, adding to what Senator Nelson said, soft power benefits, right? I mean, we are not going alone. Jim, Thomas, everyone talked about, you know, we are going as a global alliance. And, and this, the soft power benefits of our space program are really incalculable and priceless. And just so important as we move forward, um, you, know, in a, in a, you know, in a competitive environment in the world. I want to thank you all for your time and your great questions. I think we're all buzzing a bit with excitement. I'm personally wearing green for go. Uh, but before we launch, we have some great coverage for you. Tune into NASA TV tomorrow for a countdown pre-launch status briefing at 9 a.m. Eastern. And then coverage begins at midnight tomorrow night with tanking and we'll be live on our launch broadcast at 6.30 a.m. bright and early on Monday morning. So thank you again and go Artemis. <laughs>